Sorry, I'm a bit lost here. Can you see my screen? Yes, Vani, we can see it. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, so as Stephanie mentioned, I'm gonna present a, a talk um, with the title with methodologies to unravel mechanisms of communication between the microbiome and the immune systems in toxicology. Okay, so just to start with, uh, just uh, I think it's important to define toxicology because I guess not everyone is uh, working in the field. So toxicology is the area of study for adverse reactions of chemical, physical or biological agents on living organisms and ecosystems. So it's a very multidisciplinary um, uh, discipline, interdisciplinary. Uh, work. So usually we have biologists, chemistry, physicists, mathematicians, computational biology, um, and pharmacists as myself. Okay. So what I want to highlight to you today is a specific area of the toxicology that we call medical toxicology. Because what I'm interested in is to understand why some people, when they are taking a drug, which is supposed to be beneficial and cure or control a disease, they actually present sometimes adverse reactions. Okay, so we know that uh, when we study drugs or medicines, there are always the two sides. What we expect from a drug is that it's very efficacious or, or, or it's capable of treat the disease that we are supposed to be treating, and also ideally not have any adverse reactions. But unfortunately, in the real world, that's not a truth. So we can see patients with benef clinical benefits, we can see patients with no clinical benefit at all, and we see patients with toxicity or not toxicity. And just to show to you how important is this topic, um, adverse reactions account for approximately 6.5 hospital admissions in the UK, I think this data is from 2012 or 14. Uh, and it's been estimated that the cost with hospitalizations with adverse reactions, it's around 200 billion uh, billions, um, dollars worldwide. Okay, not less important, uh, toxic toxicity is a very important topic in the drug development as well. Uh, more than 50% of the drug candidates, they fail not because they don't work to treat the disease, but because they actually present some unacceptable toxicity. And uh, another interesting data is uh, in a bit more than 10 years, approximately 43 drugs were removed from the market because they found to be causing very severe adverse reactions. Okay, so what is behind the inter-individual variability? So we, are still in investigating this. We, we still don't understand fully, especially because we have very different drugs that works in different pathways. Uh, but we know that in general, there are demographic factors that affect um, drug response. We have comorbidities, um, co-medications, and when we are talking about co-medications in pharmacology, we talk about drug-drug interactions. Um, there are several environmental factors, dietary habits, for example. Uh, we are aware that there is genetic factors involved in inter-individual variability, and for sure, many unknown factors that are still to be discovered. So we are interested in um, genetic factors in our department. So there is a field called pharmacogenomics, and the, the goal of the pharmacogenomics is to really identify the polymorphisms and specific genes that affect mainly the metabolism of those drugs that can affect how these patients respond to the drug. So I don't wanna go into much details, but um, if you understand that when you take a medicine, let's say via uh, oral medicine, a tablet, um, this tablet will be dissolved in, in your stomach and then it will be absorbed in the intestine and this drug will go to your systemic circulation and will pass through the liver where most of the drug will be metabolized and the goal to metabolize this drug is to make it more easy to eliminate and most of for most of the drugs the elimination is via the renal or kidney system okay so 
just to understand the complexity of pharmacogenomics. But what we have at the moment, we want to identify factors that are associated with this variable response in patients uh, with the goal to develop predictive tools and implement what we call personalized medicine. So what's the big goal of personalized medicine is that we can maximize the benefit and reduce the adverse reactions associated with pharmacological treatments. This is like the dream and a lot of people are working on that. Uh, we have some uh, very important um, conclusions and things that are already implemented in medicine, uh, but there are definitely loads of things that need to be investigated. Okay, so I want to show this table to you. Don't want you to read the whole thing, uh, but I just want to introduce this to you that there are two main organizations, one based in the USA, uh, which is the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium and a Dutch pharmacogenetics working group, which is based in the Netherlands, which are developing guidelines based on um, guidelines based on the, the literature, what they have um, show as a specific polymorphism in, in key genes that affect the, the efficacy or toxicity of specific drugs, okay? So we have many gene drug combinations that we call actionable pharmacogen pharmacogenes. So if you identify a patient with these genes or this polymorphism in these genes, you should genotype and then make some, some adjustments in the treatment, or either changing the drug or doing a, a different dose scheme, okay? So for example, if you see here, I think I'm just gonna mention simvastatin because I think everyone heard about this drug is widely used for reduce, reducing, uh, to reduct, uh, reduce cholesterol levels in patients. So this drug is affected by a polymorphism in a gene called SLCOB1. So this gene codified for a protein, which is actually a transporter uh, that controls this, um, the drug that is intracellular to go outside the cell, the cell. So if you have a polymorphism, in this protein, you were probably more prone to develop muscle toxicity because this drug is, is accumulating intracellularly and your cells are not able to expel it. Okay. So here, one, one distinction that I want to, to make to you guys is we have small molecules and more recently, in, since the 80s, there's uh, the pharma has been developed a lot of what we call biological agents. So these drugs, as you can see here, uh, the main difference is the molecular weight. So if you think about simvastatin, this is the molecule of the simvastatin. So it's um, approximately 400 daltons. And if you see, for example, a monoclonal antibody, which is the ipilimumab, that one of the drugs that I will talk about it later, it's one for eight thousand daltons. So for obvious reasons, the toxicity profile of those drugs will be completely distinct. And we are even more far to understand the toxicity profile and the mechanism involved when we're talking about biological agents. So I, I want to introduce you to the concept of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy has been a breakthrough in oncology um, especially since 2005, six. So there are th these drugs, they brought a big hope to treat some types of cancer that has been considered to be non-treatable in the past, okay? So one specific class of immunotherapy, we, we love to classify things as you can see, so we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, okay? So these drugs, uh, the first drug was approved in 2011, and less than 10 years after, we have a huge number of cancers that can be actually treated with very good efficacy with those drugs, okay? So what is the mechanism of action of these drugs? So I think here we need to shift a bit, a bit our, para, our views about pharmacology and how drugs work because the checkpoint inhibitors, they, they are molecules that affect 
some pathways of interaction between the T cells, which are one type of immune cells, with the tumor cells. So what happened is to, in, in order to activate the T cells, and remember that activating a T cell, you can facilitate that your immune system recognize that the cancer is actually not a, not a normal cell, and you can eliminate it. So you have many co-signaling molecules in this process. It's a quite complex um, system, but uh, some researchers identified that you have some key molecules that are expressed either in the T cells or in the tumor cells, that if you switch off this inhibitory mechanism, you are going to make this T cell more reactive and will eliminate the tumor more easily. Okay? So at the moment, we have drugs approved for three main targets. One is the CTLA-4, which is expressed in T cells. We have the PD-1, PDL-1 axis. The PD-1 is expressed in T cells and the PDL-1 in the tumor cells. Okay? So in order of approval, CTLA-4 came to the market in 2011. And the commercial names of CTLA-4 is the epilimumab, is the previous molecule that I showed you in the previous slide. So we have PD-1 2014. Now we have um, three, three drugs in the market which target PD-1. And we have four drugs targeting PD-L1. So those drugs are great. They definitely make a, a, a huge benefit for specific types of cancer. But uh, on the other side, we have a different types of adverse reactions that are the immune-mediated adverse reactions. Uh, obviously, when you remove the breaks of the immune system, you don't remove the breaks of the immune system only against tumor, right? You're going to remove the breaks against everything. And it's a kind of difficult process to control. So what happened with the immune-mediated adverse reactions, they it's because there is a reduction in the self-tolerance of your immune system. And on the counterpart, you have an increase of autoimmune reactions. So <clears throat> which type of autoimmune reactions we are seeing the patients treated, treated with those drugs? So we have a, a very big range of uh, conditions. But what I want to highlight here in this uh, slide is if you see here, colitis and diarrhea, they are quite common in these patients, right? If you see the size of the bar here represent the frequency. So overall, more than 90% of the patients will present any type of adverse reactions. Uh, and the gastrointestinal system is one of the most frequently affected, okay? So coincidentally or not, we need to remember that our microbiome is mostly present in the GI tract. That's why it came to our interest that perhaps microbiome may be associated with this process or this preference for adverse reaction in patients treated with those drugs. Okay, so we know that microorganisms, they play a role in modulate the immune system homeostasis. We have most of our immune system is located in our GI tract. This is quite an um, interesting fact. Not everyone knows this, uh, but most of our immune cells are located in the GI tract. Okay? So what we want to understand is when we have an intervention with checkpoint inhibitors in humans, uh, what are the mechanisms that can lead this, some patients to develop GI tract? toxicity and other patients who don't develop any toxicity? This is our big question. Uh, I don't think it's a question that will be answered shortly. We might need a couple of years to understand, but we are starting working on that. <coughs> so why micro microbes? So uh, just remember that the human genome has been um, published in 2001. And uh, 2010, it has been reported the microbiome as our other genome. So uh, this genome is actually that we live in symbiosis with this bacteria. It represents, it's 150 times larger than our own genome. And 95% uh, of our microbiota is located in the gut. Okay? So this is a, quite a broad area of investigation. We are still trying to understand the human genome. And now we have even a bigger challenge, how we can understand 
genome of millions of species of bacteria, which uh, in total will be 100 times larger than our own genome. This is a big, big challenge. Okay. So importantly, the microbiota plays a very key role in human health and disease. If you try to find papers from the last 10 years, you're going to find um, studies associating microbiota, microbiota <coughs> excuse me, with uh, obesity, diabetes. You're going to find uh, association with uh, autism. And a lot of studies are uh, going ongoing, trying to understand the relationship between gut and brain through micro microbes. If you are interested in this topic, I recommend to have a look in this website. So Professor Rob Knight is one of the, big, the biggest names in the microbiome study. So have a look if you are interested. Okay, so the fact that the immunity uh, or homeostasis, homeostasis is uh, controlled by microbial diversity is showing these graphs. This is quite an old paper. Don't remember when exactly, but definitely before 2000. Um, so what we can see, there is an inverse relationship between infectious diseases and autoimmune diseases. So what happened here is as the technology evolves, as we find vaccines and antibiotics to cure some of this infectious disease, what's happening is that we are increasing the percentage of people who develop autoimmune conditions. Okay, so this demonstrates that sometimes having in, in, infectious conditions or having uh, exposition of different bacteria or virus, it can modulate your immune system in a way that we will have a better repertoire and uh, less prone to develop autoimmune conditions. Uh, of course, studying this complex complex systems it is complex per se so for us we we are looking to the gut okay this is our main tissue so if you think about the gut you're going to have all sorts of cells different cells so we are going to see um, immune cells no immune cells every cell with different uh, expressions of genes every cell communicating with other cells via different signaling pathways uh, and all, plus we have this microbial communities in the gut, okay? So it's very difficult to take into account everything to develop our research, but we, we highlight two main points. One is the microbiome, and the second one is the immune cells. I'm going to show you just briefly what are the options to investigate those two fields and what we are doing at the moment. Uh, so there are plenty of options of interrogate those questions but we have our own uh, methodologies to, to pursue. In terms of uh, microbial communities and its products, uh, we can go to the classical omics, right? Uh, it's a bit more complicated than the human omics. So if you want to understand the host microbiome interaction, the first thing is important to interrogate the genome of these bacteria so we can have a, an idea of the composition of the microbiome. So when we say microbiome, we are talking about everything, not only bacteria. We are talking about bacteria, virus, fungi, uh, every single living organism. So we have many, mainly two technologies. One is the 16S. So the 16S sequencing, we'll look into only bacterial species because it's gonna search for the RNA, the ribosomal RNA for specific, um, what we call organizational toxic, um, taxonomic units. You don't have the definition to go to a species or even identify specific genes in bacteria, but with 60S RNA sequencing, you have an idea of the representation of the bacteria in, in your sample. So if you want to go more deep, you need to go to metagenomics or shotgun sequencing. And then you're going to have the whole DNA sequence that you have there. You can have definition up to a species of bacteria. You're going to identify all the virus that's present there. So everything. So the amount of data that you can generate is quite huge. So obviously you, you want to interrogate 
which gen genes are expressed there. So you perhaps you maybe want to know the RNA expression, so you can do <coughs> transcriptomics or metatranscriptomics. You can perhaps say, oh no, I actually want to see the proteome. You can do metaproteomics. And finally, you can have a look in the metabolome metabolomics, right? So you can check for metabolites, which are specific from bacteria, and uh, using different technologies. I'm not going to go into that, but just to highlight how this would be possible. So it's been a lot of, there's a lot of studies in the literature showing that short chain fatty acids that are actually produced by specific types of bacteria, they have the capability to modulate T cells and make them more or less reactive and protect with dif for, from different diseases, for example, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases. Okay, so um, let's say you want to have a look in the DNA only. So first you need to extract the DNA from your sample. And when we say sample here, um, there are different, depends on what is your research question. But for us, we are interested in the gut microbiome, therefore our sample is um, the feces from patients. Uh, you, we could also get biopsies from, uh, from the gut, from patients that go for endoscopy, for example. We, are, we have the chance to get some biopsies and we can look to the microbiota associated to the, the, the wall, okay? So the microbiota that is in the lumen, which is the feces microbiota, sometimes is different than the one that is actually more close to the tissue. Okay, so again, you can choose the, the approaches if you want to go to a 16S based approach or a shotgun metagenomic. And this is just a very simplified model what you do <coughs> in terms of um, uh, analysis. There is another interesting way to look into the microbiome. So we know that in the gut, uh, we have many B cells. And B cells can produce IgA, which is one of the immunoglobulins. And this IgA, they will coat specific types of bacteria. So not every single bacteria in your gut will be coated with an IgA, but some of them will be. So you can go to uh, uh, what we call IgA seek. So what you need to do is first separate the bacteria that <clears throat> is coated with. Uh, IgA and the bacteria that are not coated with IgA. And then you can see if there is a different representation of bacteria which has this type of interaction with the immune system uh, in check if is this predisposed to any conditions, for example, colitis in, in this example here. So going back to our checkpoint inhibitors, uh, in 2017 and 18, there are those four papers that were quite, uh, in, uh, that caused a big impact in the, um, in the microbiome associated with uh, uh, treatment of checkpoint inhibitors, okay? So these studies, they basically show that depends on the composition of the microbiome, the patients were more um, prone to have a good response in terms of eliminating the cancer than the others. So I'll just show one slide here. Uh, one of these papers published in Science in 2018, the reference is here if you want to have a look more, more in depth. So what they were able to do is, is stratify the patients in responders and non-responders based on their, the bacteria that are present in their feces. And not only that, if you can see here the blue and the red, so those bacteria that you see the bar in blue, they are the bacteria that were enriched and patients that were responders to these medications. And if you look to the bacteria in red here, those bacteria were enriched in patients that were not good responders to the medication. Uh, they also found a very interesting correlation between, if you see here in the, in the other graph, the CD8 positive density. So remember that T CD8 positive cells, they are cytotoxic cells, and they were the one of the first line where the immune system will uh, fight against cancer cells, okay? So they found that uh, responders, which are, um, have this profile of bacteria in their gut, they have actually more CD8 positive, and these were correlated with the clinical resp response, which was really fantastic. 
uh, on B here, they also demonstrated that some of the immune markers, immune cell markers, for example, CD3, PD1, FOXP3, they, they have a different uh, correlations with uh, one of the main bacteria that we found in responders. Okay, so this shows that uh, there is an association between the microbiome and the efficacy of those drugs, but what's the mechanism? How, how this happened? This, an association doesn't mean causality. So the first thing that when we look for clinical studies, we always are more concerned initially to find an association, but from an association to a causality, we have a very huge amount of things to identify. So it's a very distant comparison, okay? So the second thing that we are very curious about is about the immune cells. So for this, we, we are doing what we call immunophenotyping, okay? So what is immunophenotyping? So we know that every single cell of the immune system have different uh, markers, we call markers, but they are basically cell surface proteins that uh, uh, work as a signaling markers as well. So we know classically, for example, that B cells, they, they are CD19 positive, T cells, they are CD3 positive, and they can be CD4, CD8 positive. So we have uh, cell surface markers for many, for most, most of the immune cells that we, we know so far. So we can make use of this information to, to get a pool of cells that we don't know what they are and run a technology that can be either flow or mass cytometry in order to identify which markers the cells that you are investigating are expressing. So flow or mass cytometry, they are based on, on the principle of uh, you label your cells with different colors depending on the cell surface marker. So with flow, you label antibodies with fluorochromes, and then you label these antibodies, you label your cells with these antibodies. So when you, when, you, when you do the flow cytometry, there is a fluidic system and a channel where one cell will pass each time. Every time a cell pass in this channel, there was a laser that will detect the fluorescence. If this fluorescence is red, let's say, and you tag your antibody with CD19 with red cells, so your system will detect, oh, this is a B cell, okay? So obviously you have a long process of data processing, analyzing, but just in general, that's the idea. Um, so here, I'm just trying to explain a bit better. It is, it is, uh, here is more into uh, mass cytometry. What's the difference between mass and flow? Is in flow, <clears throat> you tag your antibodies with fluorochromes, and in mass cytometry, you tag your antibodies with metal. And the acquisition is by time of flight, okay? It's by atomic masses. It's a bit more powerful technologies. You can multiplex even more. For example, you can run more 50, maybe 50 markers at the same time. In the flow, you cannot go more than 18, 15 to 18 markers, okay? So it just allow you in the same sample to investigate way more markers. Okay, so we develop a, a panel. Uh, we are working in a panel of 26 markers at the moment. Um, and once you label your samples, you run the machine, you get your output, you're gonna go through the analysis, okay? So the first step of the analysis is what we call gating strategy. If you haven't seen this type of plots, if you've seen below here, uh, is a biaxial axial plot. So you see in the x axis, for example, one of the markers. Let's take, for example, the third, the third graph here. So you have CD19 here in your x axis, and you have CD3 in your y axis. So you see this uh, red and all these dots in the graph. Every single dot represents one cell. So then what you can do, you can separate, if you see here on the top, your CD3 positive cells and CD19 
CD19 negative. So you can just gate the cells and say, okay, those are my CD3 positive cells, therefore they are T cells. So if you go below here, you want to check your CD3 negative, CD19 negative, you have 48.95% of the cells, which does not express neither CD19 or CD3. So they are not T cells and they are not TB cells. They are not B cells, they are something else. So CD19 positive cells are the one that you see in your right. 8.8% of these cell populations, they express CD19, but they don't express CD3. So that's how first you need to think about your gating strategy, what exactly you are looking for. And then the next stage, this stage is the <clears throat> most computationally demanding, let's say. So in terms of the analysis, there are loads of things that you can do with this data. And again, depends on your research question. Uh, so you can just plot your raw data, for example, the biaxial plot, the one that I show you. Uh, you can do histograms and <clears throat> you can do uh, dimensionality reduction. I'll show you one, um, one slide that's actually one of my results with uh, uh, Visni, what we call Visni. Um, and you have obviously the summarized statistic where you can represent in different ways. So there are some platforms that you can actually run this analysis. There are cluster-based platforms that make it possible for you to analyze because those data can be quite big and it definitely cannot run in a, in a computer. So if you don't have a processor, you can use Cytobank. You have to pay for it, obviously, but this is a very uh, good platform. I'm currently using Cytobank and I do recommend. So, what is Visni? So people call Tisney. So Tisney is the two parameter that they calculate the Tisney one and Tisney two. <coughs> so Visni basically get the expression for every single cell, the expression of all the markers that you've labeled. In my case, I've labeled 26 markers. Okay. Uh, and just give you a picture of uh, everything together which clusters you have of cells based on the expression of specific uh, markers. So what I've done here, every, if you see the first row here is sample one, and the second row is sample two, right? So for every column, I have uh, show one specific marker, for example, CD4 in the first column. And if you see the colors, every single dot again is a single cell but if you see the colors if it's more red it means that higher expression of that marker so if you move to the second plot you're going to see now it's cd8 and you can see that the red here is um, is in a different location okay so like this you can compare your samples so let's make a very simple comparison if you see cd14 in my graph here they are they are located here in, in sample one if i look into sample two i have much less cells cd14 so perhaps i can uh, hypothesize that cd14 is um, is reduced in in sample two which is equivalent to my group uh, b let's say depends on what you're comparing so you can do a lot of explorations of your data set it's a very powerful uh, technology in terms of interrogation of the immune system. Okay, so and then you can uh, you can sub subdivide in many cells. I just put the main cell types here, the main immune uh, cell types, which is CD T, CD4 positive, CD8 positive, B cells, monocytes, and NK cells. And this data is from uh, peripheral peripheral blood cells, but you can do in a tissue. I also do in gut biopsies, where first you need to disaggregate your cells and then label and then run in the fluid fluidic system okay so uh yeah so what is the big the big issue here um when we invest when we look when we are doing research in biology we tend to underestimate the complexity of the system but this is because it's impossible to account to every single thing in one experiment but the big challenge is really how we put all these players together and how can we obtain and extract information that can be useful, in this case, for, patient, for patients. 
how can we get mechanisms here that we can explore it further and perhaps develop new interventions to prevent adverse reaction to those medications because those medications are very effective we don't want to remove them from the market of course but we want to find a way where patients can be treated with these drugs but we can perhaps use something or do some adjustments in the dose or in the regimen to prevent adverse reaction because sometimes these patients has to stop the treatment due to adverse reaction and then their cancer just came back so it's a very di uh, difficult balance here so and you can see here's the gut homeostasis is a very complicated uh, <clears throat> um, pathway many cells involved you have cytokines which are substances produced by the immune cells that uh, play a role in recruitment of cells or activation of deactivation of cells so we have uh, bacteria we have uh, also cells that produce antimicrobial peptides we have the bacteria producing the metabolites and i guess we are trying to put the pieces together and try to extract uh, uh, useful information or something to move forward okay so i just want to i think the main message here is really uh, make us think how can we make sense how can we int integrate all these different levels of data and 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 get something useful for patients out of it right so this is a very interesting picture so we can look only for molecules if you want but we are ignoring a whole set of things. So we can look only for population, but we, we don't have the, the depth of the molecules. So the question is, how can we integrate the information that we can obtain from molecules, DNA, RNA, proteins, metabolites? How can we uh, individual cells with their specific profile, immune, if it's immune, is immune profile, if it's a no immune cells with their signaling pathways, how can we put this in a context of different tissues? Uh, how can we think in anti-cancer, for example, we need to think about the cancer uh, tissue and the, the toxicity, the, the toxic tissue, let's say. So we are thinking about melanoma, uh, but we are also thinking about the gut. So two, the two tissues, for sure, they behave completely different. They have totally different mechanisms of uh, function. We need to put all of this together, okay? So we are living in a system era. Um, I, I'm sure that you've heard <coughs> about this before, excuse me. So the systems, um, system biology, and then you have system pharmacology, system toxicology, and you have systems everything now. So this is the, the, the most important thing that I think that you are now. We are, we are capable to, to develop and to run technologies in a very high speed so the biggest challenge is how to develop robust computational methods that we can make sense of this all, all this data so i just put here if you do a search in the pubmed uh, with the term system biology in the last 20 years you're going to see 150,000 papers published in the last 20 years with the term system biology and for sure if you search um, machine learning or artificial intelligence, those numbers will be slightly lower, but tend to be increased in the, in the next year. And this is a really multidisciplinary work. So everyone can contribute. So I think uh, it's very important, the computational uh, methods. People need to work and develop mathematical models that we can use to predict things, phenotypes in, in, in medicine, in biology um and it's, it's a quite exciting field it's quite complicated but uh, very exciting and i think that's the future uh also yeah this is my my main message and um obviously the work that i've been doing i would not do without support of many people and institutions so i just want to thank uh, university of liverpool all my funding agencies ukri mrc uh, the studies that we are undertaking in Liverpool called HIST um, and I have a, a huge team and I, I need to thank and nothing will be possible without support from people and institutions. So uh, I hope I could deliver the message but I'm extremely happy to take any questions either via chat 
in Spanish, I can try my best to understand, but I'll reply in, in English and then uh, Stephanie can translate to you guys, not a problem. Uh, my email, if you want to email at any, any time to ask anything. So thank you very much for listening and open for questions. Vanet, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I, I have to admit that I've known you for a very long time and I think this is the first time that I can see your, your work in depth and it's amazing, I'm, I've learned so much. <laughs> so there are a few questions <laughs> that people ask. There's one that says, can you sort out cells in mass cytometry as you do in flow? No, yes, yeah, so, uh, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, no, because when you do mass cytometry, we, you actually destroy the cells, you fragment the cells before detection. So the, the machine detects the metal, right? And by atomic mass and time of flight, it's like mass spectrometry, but it's cytometry because it's from cells, not uh, from molecules. But you actually fragment the cells before the detection. So you cannot recover anything, unfortunately. And then there's another question that says, according to checkpoint inhibitors, does the stage of development of cancer at which checkpoint inhibitors are applied affect its effectiveness? Um, well, this is a very new area. So I have to say that uh, when the first drug was approved in 2011, the infliximab, uh, and then what people were doing, because those drugs are quite powerful, so not every type of cancer can be treated with checkpoint inhibitors. I think I need to start from that. So there are many studies going on trying to show that these drugs work better than the best, best drug that they have at the moment for different cancer settings. But the approvals for use is very specific. For example, um, malignant melanoma, it's, uh, there, there was no option before before checkpoint inhibitors. And then they were clearly and very easily went to the market to treat this specific type of cancer. So not all the cancers can be treated with those drugs, but there are many clinical studies going on trying to show that these drugs are effective to other types of cancer and, and is a very uh, fast moving area. But we don't know in terms of the severity, probably, but I cannot tell you because uh, every, every ca cancer will be different and it's, it's, it's a very new field. But I, I expect that uh, it depends on the severity, you're going to have different responses, I think in general. So I expect an immunotherapy as well. Okay. And then I have a question regarding, so I really like the fact that you mentioned that you could have different tissues and then they can behave differently, right? So when you analyze the data, can you have an antagonistic result that needs a different type of technique or needs something more in depth in order to understand what is going on as a whole? Is my question clear? You mean if you compare different tissues? Yes, or different samples. Because let's say you use, I don't know, blood, and then you use a tissue. And then the, the expression of cells is different or the expression of, of protein of surface proteins it's different in both uh, samples so how yeah. can you how can you predict or how can you give a final result if, if they are so different is there like a a different technique that you need to complement with or how did you approach a result like that uh, i think what we expect to be different we don't expect to be the same so for example i'm currently comparing um blood cells with um, immune cells in the gut okay so just basic if you look uh, in the blood you're going to find majority of the t-cells are cd4 positive and if you look in the tissue majority of the t-cells are cd8 positive so you expect to have differences and because obviously the expression of genes of each cell depend on what is next to them as well because it depend on the environment so imagine a tissue you have um, cells that are in a solid solid tissue in, in very close contact with different cells which are epithelial cells and all the different types of uh, gut cells uh, and if you think about blood it's a moving area so it's actually a tube where the blood is circulating all the time and these cells are crossing with uh, epithelial cells and 
other types of blood cells and they're not really stuck like in a, in a, in a solid tissue. So we are never gonna find a consensus. I think the most important thing is to understand what's the difference in different tissues. So, and how can we extract what is important from these differences? Because difference we'll have for sure. Uh, but how to extract what is important? Is it relevant the number of the cells or is it relevant the cell that express a specific protein? So I think here another thing is important to remember in terms of um, single cells RNA seq. So this is the most deep level of complexity that you can do because then imagine if you get single cell RNA expression of 10,000 cells and each cell will express maybe, I don't know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 genes. H how can you make sense of all of this? How are you going to develop strategies to understand what is important from all of this. And then the number of cells, you can have 30% T cells and then 20 B cells. And then uh, with B cells, you can stratify in maybe five or six more. So I think we are very far to understand a very com complex system and depends on which uh, method we decide to interrogate. But I think it's important to have in mind that when we are doing research in a very specific point, we are ignoring all the rest, so our conclusions can be very biased. Yeah, so but it's part of the science. Yeah, 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 it, it, it makes sense. One has to, to focus and to make some presumptions in order to, to predict something. Vane, there's another question which says, in general, for FDA-approved drug repurposing, are pharmacogenomics studies required or suggested? For repurposing specifically? Yes. Mm, not necessarily. For, for, for repurposing, the good thing is that the drug is known already. You know the safety, the toxic, toxicity profile, right? So you don't need to redo it. So when you are doing repurposing, just to go back to the beginning. So to develop a drug, you need to have first a drug candidate that's proved to be okay in animal models. And then you if you have a good uh, amount of evidence to show this is safe to be tested in human, humans, and then you go to phase one. Phase one, you are testing the safety to use in healthy volunteers. If pass, it's okay this phase, you go to the next one, which is a phase two, you're gonna start testing safety and efficacy. And then in the, the phase three, it's only efficacy because you prove already that is safety. So if the drug is already in the market, it means that has been passed all these stages. It means it is a safe drug overall, okay? okay. So well, the only thing that you need to prove is if it, there is an efficacy for the specific condition that you are trying to repurpose the drug. So usually, if there is a drug that you know there is a pharmacogenetic marker involved, obviously you should include this in your, in your new, um, new approval. Uh, but if it's a drug that is not very clear, the, um, if there is pharmacogen pharmacogenes involved, usually, no, people don't tend to. But I have to say that the early drug development, people are more and more interested in looking to pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics, because if you understand that your drug is not going to be helpful for everyone and you can stratify and say oh this this drug is group is is great but for this specific group of people the industry from the industry point of view it's uh, is advantage because um they are reducing the risk that uh, this drug will be removed from the market due to toxicity okay. i don't know if it makes sense i uh, yeah I, you did if the person who asked <laughs> wants to extend the chat is open for that. But then I think it calls my attention regarding these times of coronavirus. Have you seen the trend in, in Europe? Because, well, now you're based in Germany. The trend on, on this field related to coronavirus. Have you seen any, any trend or is it something reported regarding this? In terms of a correlation between the microbiome and how people could respond to a potential treatment? Um, you mean in terms of the coronavirus specific situation or? or yes, yes, in terms of, 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 you know, on your experience and what you have seen over there. I don't think, I think uh, regarding coronavirus, people are extremely focused on, on vaccines and treatments. So no one 
even have the opportunity to explore uh, microbiome related. But what is quite interesting, and for us, it caused some sort of concern, that uh, some studies demonstrated that you actually eliminate a lot of the virus in your stool samples, okay? So in your feces. So this is, a, in, this is an extra source of contamination if you manage, um, if you ma imagine some countries that doesn't have the, uh, the treatment of you know, this type of products. So how you're gonna be contaminating, spreading the virus all over the places. And um, from us that we are receiving this type of samples from patients, from now on, we need to increase our level of safety at work because we know that the virus can be present in these samples. And it's even more present than blood, which is quite new for us. But I think people will go to look to microbiome and coronavirus predisposition or, or severity in the future. Uh, at the moment, I think, uh, most of the energy has been concentrated in treatments and vaccines, but it's going to happen because the microbiome has been studied in everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if someone else has another question. I, I feel that I monopolize that Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa, maybe another question that I would like to ask is regarding the Weissman, the, the, the dimension reduction. That's a very mm -hmm. interesting plot that you show us. And I think that I'm, I'm, my question is more on the sense of how you treat the data in order to produce that type of graphs. Okay, so yeah, this is a specific uh, package. You, you can run in R, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not a R expert, <laughs> even, even though I've been trying, but uh, didn't reach this level. So I use this platform, which is Cytobank. So okay. Cytobank, basically, they, they've made this, um, this coding a more user-friendly. Okay. And uh, I can generate the graphs and I can run all sorts of analysis. It's very specific for mass cytometry data, I have to say. So Cytobank is for mass cytometry data. Uh, but you can do mass cytometry data in R. Okay. Okay. Cytometry data. Okay. Thank you, Vani. I think it's, very, it's a very interesting topic. It's very trendy and very high tech, let's say. The, the technology that you show us, the approach, the integration of information, it's very complex and very interesting. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have you, very honored as well, because you, you are giving us precious time, especially because it's very late for you due to the different time zones. So thank you very much. I, I don't know if someone has again another question, please don't feel, uh, maybe is scared or worried because of the language. The idea is to, to create a bridge where everyone can share knowledge. Vane also speaks a, a bit of Spanish as well, so she can try. <laughs> Vane, there's another question which says, how accessible is this technology um, in the tropics? The one that you show us, which is a very fair question. Yeah, well, uh... Yeah, I have to say it's a quite expensive technology because it's new. Um, I'm, I don't know in Latin America, for example, or except US and Canada, America from Mexico down, I'm not aware of any, any place that has got a machine. Um, in, the, in the UK, we've got maybe four or five. Um, I think it will become cheaper and more accessible with time. Uh, but now, yes, uh, uh, yeah, I have to say it's, it's a bit expensive. But I mean, if you are interested, I don't see a problem, for example, to try a collaboration in, in place that has got this machine, either in America or, or in Europe, and just bring the samples over and run here. Because we can actually keep the samples frozen. That's what we do. We isolate from patients. Oh, we don't run on a daily basis. So we, we freeze the cells the same way that you would freeze uh, cell lines in liquid nitrogen. And then when we are gonna run the experiment, we defrost and <clears throat> stain and then run the samples. So yeah, if you want to collaborate in, in any of this, uh, I'm happy to, to try to find out if there is any other place maybe um, in America or, uh, or in Europe uh, more close to you. Um, I'm happy. So we have my email in the end of the presentation. I can send also to Stephanie. She can 
send to you my email so please feel free to get in touch <laughs> thank you yeah Juan, Juan is the one who who asked that question and then I think that maybe something that some of the people at the chat will be interested on it's in the fact that the type of samples that we can run here we can produce here in Costa Rica are not exactly related to human samples so how feasible do you think it's to translate the technology and the, the state of the art created to different samples which are non-models, which are, for example, I don't know, living organisms as in a lizard, a crocodile, or things like that, a monkey. You, you know what I mean, like something more tropical, not exactly human. Mm -hmm. I think in theory it's possible. The, the difficulty that you might face when you work with uh, no humans and no mouse or rat models is to find the antibodies. Okay. Because all this technology are based in having good antibodies, that antibodies that are specific for the protein that you are interested. In. So I'm not really, I don't really know how is the antibody availability for other species, but with not mouse and rat and humans, because yeah, because I, I never look for it. Uh, but I think if you have good antibodies, you can do you can do both flow or, or mass cytometry. It's not a problem. The, the tricky part is to get, have a good antibody. Yeah, that makes completely sense. Vanian, we are uh, uh, squeezing you here. <laughs> There's... It's okay. Don't worry. I'm, so, I'm super happy to have a chat, so please feel free. I'm, I'm very happy as well that everyone can like really uh, go ahead with questions because Vanessa knows a lot. <laughs> so there's another question which says, in pharmacogenomic studies in a, new, in a new drug discovery pipeline, are there a specific human ethnicities or group ages that are recommended to include in the design? Hmm. Let me, let me think. It's a very, very interesting it and, is, yeah. tricky, and, and tricky question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it is, it is actually. I think there are many things here. So, if you think about the pharmacogenomic study, this is more frequently observed after approval of the drug. So, for example, we do pharmacogenomic studies and we do with drugs that are already in the market, not in drug discovery pipeline, okay? So I never work in a drug discovery pipeline with pharmacogenetics in, in a company, for example. So I, I'm not the best person to talk how it will be in this scenario but i can tell you after marketing um, so we we recruit patients on specific drugs okay so the drugs that we are interested in, and then we we do the genotyping for the specific genes that we are interested in or the genes usually the genes that are relevant to the pathway of the drug or the disease uh, but we can also go to genome wide for example okay so or exome so it depends so uh, when we, it, it depends how, what's your question. I think uh, ethnicity is a very important thing to be considered because there are a very huge variability in the frequency of a specific alleles in different populations. Mm -hmm. So you can see very clearly that most of the studies in genetics, they are done either in the US, Canada, or in Europe. So our population, for example, in Brazil, um, in South America, Central America, Africa, they are very poor represented. So we are really struggling to, to get um, allele frequencies in these populations. And there's a lot of people interested in doing this more admixed population. I think especially Latin America, for example, um, from Brazil, I can tell you more about that. So we, we are very admixed. So we are very few Indian, a native Indian people, plus a lot of uh, Portuguese, Spanish, Europeans, and some Africans. So we are a population that is very mixed. And the frequency of these alleles, these pharmacogenes uh, that are relevant for us, it, it's, it's very poor known because most of, if you go to the database, you're going to find Europeans, um, but very few admixed populations. So it's very interesting if we can get. Uh, information on uh, the specific ethnicities that we don't find in Europe and USA. So regarding ages, we don't expect actually age to be affected by genetics, but we expect age to affect uh, response to drugs. 
So it depends. If your question is, um, you want to look only for the gene, really? So age should not be a factor because you, you, you were born and you die with the same DNA. So it doesn't matter which age you're going to measure or, or identify your polymorphism. You have the same DNA, theoretically. Okay. <laughs> um, and in terms of the design, again, it, it really depends on your research question. It's very tricky to say like in a very simplified way, but, uh, but yeah, you have many options to include, depend on what is your, your research question. It I is, hope I didn't make more confused than actually answer your question. <laughs> well, I think it's a, it's a very interesting approach. To be honest, I, I've, never, I've never paid real attention to that. I've only paid attention to the fact that sometimes drugs are tested on males more than females due to the change of hormones and, and the spikes on, on hormone production month to month, right, between females. But the fact that some ethnicities or, or specific groups should be included, I've never thought about it. So it's a really interesting question and approach, right? Yeah, it, it should. Definitely it should. But that's not what happened with most of the drugs that we have in the market, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I don't know if someone else has another question. Really, if you want to ask in Spanish, that's not a problem at all. If there's no one else who has a question, I think that that we can conclude that the, the session at this point. And then thank you again, Vane, for your time, your, uh, your awareness and your specific questions and detailed uh, questions, no, sorry, answers, your detailed answers through the whole session. Thank you very, very much. It has been an honor to have you as a friend and as a colleague. <laughs> no, this is a pleasure, really. I'm very glad with the invitation. I'm always super happy to share um, what I've learned, what I was lucky to learn in this more than 10 years um, in different countries. And I think, um, yeah, so we, we are here to share knowledge. So there's no reason to hide, to keep the knowledge for ourselves. So we are all one, we are all connected. Um, yeah, and it's really been a pleasure. So p please feel free to make contact if you want at any point. Uh, I hope, uh, I was not too fast in the speaking and I hope it makes sense. <laughs> I, I <laughs> thank you very is. much for the invitation again, uh, Stephanie. Uh, much appreciated. Thank Great. you. Vanny. Yeah, have a wonderful evening because for you it's a bit late. And thank you everyone <laughs> for being present for your questions and your time. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Buenas a todos, ahora nada más voy a pasar a español. Eh, la charla va a ser, eh, bueno, fue, eh, eh, perdón, grabada <ríe> y va a ser subida al, eh, al canal de El ABAP que se encuentra en YouTube. Si tienen alguna pregunta respecto a cómo accesar al canal, vamos a postear el link en nuestras redes sociales que son Instagram, Facebook y Twitter. Así que con esto finalizo. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todas de verdad por participar. Que estén muy bien. Hasta luego.